we can start. Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very delighted to uh, start this uh, session on uh, uncovering uh, inequality, the space for innovation in developing world. We have an excellent uh, panel. I will introduce my colleagues in a, in a minute. Um, in the panel, we will tackle what uh, the international uh, community uh, and partner uh, governments can and need to do to promote innovation that benefits uh, developing uh, countries. Uh, and before I begin, I just want to let you know that this session is, uh, is being recorded and uh, will be posted uh, on the government uh, aftershock site following the, the, the event. Uh, to dive right to, uh, uh, to our uh, discussion, uh, we know that uh, COVID pandemic and its consequences will increase poverty and drive further inequality worldwide. We launched it very recently at the OECD two reports that outline at this dimension, the States of Fragility report, but also the global outlook on financing for sustainable development. And with our three distinguished discussions, we will draw lessons learned from uh, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic to explore how to promote uh, innovations that benefit the poorest and most vulnerable population. So let me start by introducing uh, the panel. Uh, we have with us Dr. Jamila uh, Mahmoud, uh, is a special advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia on public health. Uh, she, took, uh, uh, she took up her position in March 2020 uh, in the middle of this crisis. Um, uh, previously, she was the Under Secretary uh, for partnerships at the International Federation of uh, Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies. In this role, she spared the uh, IFRC reports on um, uh, innovative finance and locally led uh, innovation. And special thanks for you to join at this, at this very late hour. Uh, we have also with us um, Jaidi Prabhu, uh, he is a professor of uh, marketing at the University of uh, Cambridge. Such a business, uh, business school is uh, author of numerous um, uh, publications on innovation. I'm sure that you, you know uh, most of them. And associate editor of the Journal of, of Marketing. He has researched innovation uh, uh, in emerging markets and low income contexts uh, and su successfully advanced the concept of frugal innovation. Uh, I'm sure that. Uh, Jadip will, will, will talk about that in a, in a while. And um, last but not the least, we have with us uh, Amy Lin. Uh, she's the acting director of the USAID Center for Innovation and Impact. Uh, USAID is team to promote innovations in the health uh, sector. Uh, prior to joining the USAID in 2013, she worked on social enterprise models in Mumbai and was uh, uh, HIV ADS program director for the Clinton Health Access uh, Initiative in Liberia. And we are all thrilled to have the chance to hear from you from that experience as well. So uh, as moderator, I will guide you through the discussion, steering uh, questions. We'll try to have a lively uh, discussion, uh, uh, preferably with, uh, with several rounds of, of, of interventions. Uh, and I encourage our discussions to react uh, to one another in their uh, interventions. Uh, to our audience, please uh, share your reflections um, questions in the chat. I have some, co some colleagues that will uh, pick some of these uh, uh, questions we'll and will share with, uh, with us for our uh, discussion. To start our discussion, let's do a quick poll uh, of the audience. Uh, you will know, will now see on your screen, I hope, uh, two statements. For each statement, you will uh, select uh, uh, whether you strongly agree, uh, agree, uh, uh, disagree, or strongly uh, disagree. Uh, the, 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 the statements uh, are uh, the following. Um, uh, innovations can provide an effective response to the challenge of leaving no one behind. Uh, I hope that we can have the the statements in the in the screen. Uh, 
let me advance the second question while we will try to the questions in the in the in the screen. Uh, so the the second question is uh, um, uh, is is the following, and 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 uh, um, they won't appear in the screen. So so I will repeat the first question. I think it's uh, it's uh, it's best because you will not get it in the in the screen. So the first question is: Innovations can uh, provide an effective response to the challenge on leaving one behind. And again, please state whether you strongly agree. Uh, agree, disagree, or strongly uh, uh, disagree. And the question two, and in and in the the, the chat you can you can uh, uh, vote uh, for for these two questions. The statement two is the COVID nineteen crisis reveals that governments and their partners are doing enough to enable innovation for sustainable development. I will I will repeat uh, because we don't get it in the screen. The COVID nineteen crisis reveals that governments. Are, and their partners are doing uh, enough to enable innovation for sustainable uh, development. So if you could vote again, uh, uh, stating whether you strongly agree, uh, agree, disagree, uh, or strongly disagree. And you have to look uh, under polls. So you, you have the, the that, that, uh, uh, option okay i realize that i'm the only one that cannot see the question but but participants can see the i've been informed that participants can see it in their in their in their screens and uh, and uh, and uh, 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 the questions in the in the pool uh, in the poll tab. Uh, and again, I, I invite all uh, participants in this session to go to the to the poll tab and to and to vote. Um, once we we get uh, the result, the result, of course, I will I will share it with uh, uh, with all. My colleagues are facilitating that voting exercise. Me and the, the panelists, we are the only ones that cannot vote. So we are, we are a bit inactive while everybody is very active uh, voting, but I'm, I'm sure that we'll get the, the, the results in a second. Okay, I've been advised to start uh, as as uh, as uh, uh, the participants continue to, to vote, so uh, to avoid uh, wasting any time. I think that uh, we should start with the uh, with the most important part, which is hearing from our uh, distinguished um, uh, discussants. Uh, an enabling local uh, environment, uh, as we all know, is 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 critical for successful innovation and creating such an environment depends uh, to a large extent on governments. So I'd like to, to address in this first round the role of, uh, of, of, of government uh, and what's your opinion on, 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 on the role uh, uh, from governments to create this enabling space for uh, uh, innovation. Let's try, start with uh, uh, Jamila. Uh, at, at Red Cross uh, and Red Crescent, uh, you have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, spearheaded efforts to locally led uh, innovations. Which insights um, from this work uh, are helping you to promote innovations in public health in the government of Malaysia, especially in this very challenging uh, context? So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Georgia, and good evening, everyone. It's very late here, so I'm saying good evening. Um, I think that it, from the perspective of my experience working in the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent, societies, innovation is very much local and it's driven by, uh, by um, a, I guess, an approach that says that the innovators are actually the people themselves living in communities that may be facing development, development challenges 
or humanitarian crisis themselves. So, you know, we, we have to look at innovation, not just as a top-down approach, which is basically, you know, governments creating the ecosystems and the environments for innovation to thrive, but also, you know, allowing and recognizing that innovators are in communities. And what we need to do is really um, encourage and also guide that innovation to be taken to uh, a level that can then be applied within that. Now, we often hear of innovation as something that has to be taken to scale. And I, I just want to caution that you know, the in, in innovation environment is very, very, very heterogeneous. It is so variable depending from country to country, from region to region. So while it might, wo might work at a local level, it may not need to be taken to scale. So I think we've got to really contextualize uh, innovation. So from that, you know, from a government perspective now, what in Malaysia, uh, we have a Malaysian Global Innovation Centre, and what is done is actually create, you know, a few opportunities to stimulate an innovation environment. One is creating, uh, you know, an innovation sandbox with a, a significant amount of funding for local innovators to come forward and, you know, play in that sandbox, not just to receive funding, but also the mentorship. It's also got things like matching grants so that you, know, you can get social enterprises trying to, uh, you know, be innovative, but have some form of support uh, to, to help them with that. So, uh, and, and also it's going beyond Malaysia using a regional approach in ASEAN so that there can be also approaches that can actually be applied to the different part, different countries in ASEAN, but also allowing social enterprises and to, to penetrate the ASEAN market, so to speak. So innovation needs that kind of uh, ecosystem, the regulations, the, the opportunities, the funding uh, that, that is uh, required but at the same time, recognizing that a lot of those innovators are at local level. So in, in the Red Cross, we, we don't just go for challenges. We really recognize the importance of uh, lead, you know, lead, uh, um, lead user innovation as well as positive deviance. So really having a variety of approaches to innovation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jamila. And, and, and while uh, you're sharing this insightful uh, uh, information with all of us. We received the, the results of the of the poll, and this could be uh, helpful for uh, uh, Jaydeep and for uh, Amy for their interventions. We have just uh, heard that that uh, on uh, statement one, uh, you remember about uh, the uh, the you know the fact that innovations can provide an effective response to challenges of leaving one behind. Only twelve percent disagree. And 88% agree with this role of uh, innovation. And on the question two, that is more related with COVID, uh, about uh, the to which extent COVID crisis reveals that governments and their partners are doing enough to enable innovation for sustainable uh, development. 19% um, uh, 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 strongly uh, disagree. So let me start by by the most important. So 11.5% strongly agree. 7.7% disagree. So you can see that a uh, uh, minority uh, ag agrees with the fact that uh, COVID is, is boosting innovation. And then you have 61% uh, uh, disagree, 19% strongly disagree. So it, it, it means that uh, there is a, a huge need for provide um, uh, innovation to foster change uh, in the reaction to the crisis. So, uh, Jadip, you have been working, as I mentioned uh, before, on in, in innovation in low and middle income uh, countries. How do you see the role that governments can and should play in promoting innovation? The floor is yours. Thank you, George. And again, it's a great pleasure to be with all of you on this uh, panel. Um, you know, actually, Jamila gave a wonderful answer, and I'm very much in, uh, you know, an agreement with her about the role of governments. Um, they have a very important role to play, but they have a very particular role to play, which may be different from the innovators themselves. Um, you know, a lot of innovation is happening in any kind of economy around the world, from the grassroots, like Jamila was saying, people who face problems often come up with their own solutions. You have now uh, an entrepreneurial revolution happening around the world. You have a revolution of social enterprise, where entrepreneurs are trying to solve social problems using kind of business and technology. And then of course you have large organizations in the private sector and also NGOs, governments and so on. So what role does the government then play? And I would say two things here. 
One is, you know, the government should resist the temptation to be too controlling and to replicate or duplicate the activities of others. So rather than controlling, uh, they should try to coordinate and facilitate and nurture. These are some of the words that Jamila used as well. They should nurture. And the phrase that I think of is, instead of the government, you know, rowing, they should steer. Others are doing the rowing, they should steer. They should help others steer. So that's the first thing. Government should have that approach of nurturing, uh, uh, steering rather than rowing. And the second thing I would say was to Jamila's point about the government helping with the ecosystem. So we now understand, I think, very well that whether we're talking at a very local level, we're talking at a regional level or a national level or an intergovernmental level, really what matters is this ecosystem. So for the innovation to thrive, you need two sets of things. You need people who are trying out experiments, so a lot of variation. They're trying out crazy things, uh, some of them. Um, you need that. But then you also need a second mechanism of selection and scaling. You need some organization to then select some of these ideas. And Jamila used this word positive deviance, you know, find the positive deviance, pick up these outliers, and then scale them with the resources you have. And the government can play a very big role in facilitating and nurturing both aspects. And they can often do this on a, on a platform, on a digital platform. And I think we have some very interesting examples coming from intergovernmental organizations or development organizations. So I'm sure Amy can say more about this, but last year at the OECD, they launched, USAID launched their um, Million Lives Club, which is an example to me of that kind of platform, which brings together people with lots of ideas, uh, trying out experiments with those who can help scale it. Um, uh, I also do some work with the Commonwealth Secretariat and they too are doing something similar with the Commonwealth countries, creating a digital platform, particularly during COVID to help particularly some of the smaller countries that may not have resources, some of the island nations uh, to draw on the experiences of others to solve some of their problems. So that's what I'd like to say on that point. Thank you, Jadip. And, and that uh, last part is something that we particularly value as, a, as a, um, a, an important role that OECD can also play uh, for this knowledge sharing uh, uh, approach. Uh, Amy, as I mentioned uh, earlier, uh, you have not just worked in, 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 in several developing countries in the, in the past, but now at OECD, uh, you, you, you are uh, um, well, focusing a lot on, on on how to support innovations in low and middle income countries. What are some uh, of the challenges and opportunities for innovation that uh, emerge in your discussions with, uh, with governments in partner countries? So can you share uh, some information with us on this? Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you, George. And thank you all for organizing this and appreciate the OECD for bringing us together. And I very much um, agree with the comments that Jamil and Jaideep just shared as well. I love this idea of a innovation sandbox that Jamila spoke to and the, the value of nurturing rather than controlling. I think that speaks to donor governments as well as um, local go partner governments um, and how can we be true partners and learners with our partner countries as we think about the role innovation can play. I also wanted to reflect on the exciting poll results uh, that you just shared, George. I think that really speaks to the potential that um, this group sees around innovation and also to recognize it's not fully um, achieved yet. There is a lot of excitement around innovations and we see that in our conversations and discussions with our partner country governments and we see it from the innovator community that Jaydeep was pointing out around the world, whether it's innovators we've recognized in the Million Lives Club or those we've supported before through our health grand challenges such as fighting Ebola or combating Zika when we responded to, to past um, pandemics with open innovation calls. Uh, one exciting aspect that we have seen is how we can repurpose or adapt to, to, to use borrow a word that we were just referencing as panelists right before this, the existing capabilities that we do have. So for example, we had previously invested in a two-way communication platform called mHero that allows the Ministry of Health in Liberia to communicate with their frontline community health workers. That's crucial in any pandemic. And we actually funded it in the context of the Ebola outbreak a few years ago, but it's extremely useful now when we need to share the latest information on COVID-19 with those same frontline health workers. And today, we already have that infrastructure set up in Liberia. Those community health workers already are, have that application on their, their mobile phones. And so we're just able to respond even faster and more effectively 
than we would have been without those earlier innovation investments. We're also helping map other digital health solutions across 25 countries so that governments are empowered with the information they need on what's already in their countries and what they can use for COVID-19. And that's another way we're hoping to be able to catalyze and um, extend support, um, but to Jagdeep's point, not, not control what happens. Um, innovations can help us provide cheaper, more effective um, uh, services, especially in the healthcare space. So again, for Ebola, we had funded shift labs for their drip assist innovation that helps healthcare workers uh, monitor IV infusion rates. It costs a tenth the cost of a typical infusion pump. It runs on a single AA battery, it takes less than 10 minutes to train somebody on. So you get more effective for a lower cost. And that's exactly the kind of um, capability building innovations we need. And then I just want governments and countries, but we can also work at a sub-national level. And Jamila had pointed out that many innovations should be very local and hyper um, contextualized or adapted to their needs. And so in South Africa, we're working with the Project Last Mile partnership with Coca-Cola and DFID and many other partners and working with um, a public-private partnership in the province of the Western Cape to enable local manufacturers to now manufacture textile masks to protect their own communities. And they're producing over 100,000 um, in, the, in the near term future. So we're excited to be partnering with partnerships like Project Last Mile and their Ubuntu cloth mask initiative. We're excited to work with the government of Liberia on their um, MHERO innovation rollout and, um, and extending it to DRC and Sierra Leone. And we're excited to continue thinking about how the past investments and innovations that we've made, such as Shift Labs, can continue to play a role in the emergency response we need right now for COVID-19. Thank you, Amy. I think that um, the, the, it's the perfect segue to, to the, the next round where I would like us to focus on, on, on what we have already learned from the, 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 the role of innovation in, in the response to, uh, to COVID. And, and by the way, I would uh, invite uh, the, the audience to continue um, tabling questions uh, in the chat. Uh, we will um, uh, get our, our uh, distinguished uh, uh, speakers uh, while well, answering to some of these questions uh, uh, at the end. Uh, as I was mentioning, the, the, the COVID has, 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 has put tremendous uh, uh, challenges well, uh, in, in, uh, in, in developing countries and innovation plays a vital role. I know that it, it's uh, too soon to, to have a complete uh, 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 understanding of what, of what has been the, the, the role of innovation, but I think that uh, we, we have already collected, as our, our panelists mentioned, uh, information that shows uh, the relevance of, 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 of innovation. So the question is, how can we get better at uh, developing innovations for the poorest and bringing them to market and to scale? And this is very much aligned with the with the points made earlier, so I will I will take now a different order uh, of our uh, panelists. I would like to start with uh, with Jedi. As I mentioned in the beginning, you have been championing what you call frugal uh, innovations. Can you explain what um, this is and how frugal innovations could be making a difference in the in the COVID uh, response? Absolutely. Thanks, George. So for me, frugal innovation is really about doing more and better uh, for more people with less resources. And, you know, I was inspired to, to learn about this from people who are in those situations, you know, uh, like Jamila was saying, people who are in the grassroots, uh, who are struggling to solve problems in their lives with limited resources, you know, and you see this, you know, around the world, but particularly in middle and low income countries, particularly in rural areas, you see, or in urban slums, you see people with very few resources coming up with ingenious solutions to many problems that they face. And often that solution makes use of resources they have to substitute for resources they don't have. 
And you know, this is a theme that will come up again and again. They look around to see what they have, and then they combine, recombine, repurpose, reuse the resources they have to solve their problems. And I think that that idea is a very powerful idea, not reinventing the wheel, not doing something for the sake of you know, something new or coming up with some new technology for the sake of doing that, because that can be expensive, but really understanding what the need is and then working backwards to see how you can use existing resources to come up with a solution. So that for me is what frugal innovation is. And really, why do you have this? Why is it so important? You know, essentially it's to preserve resources, to make the most of what you have, but also to come up with an affordable solution, actually a very a highly affordable solution for the people who are the beneficiaries, but also the people who are delivering the solution. So that's what frugal innovation means to me. It's a kind of making the best use of resources, being inclusive, trying to reach people who are ingenious, but often you know, struggle to uh, scale the solutions that they might have developed in their local context. And you know, I've studied this for many years, but I've particularly been interested to see what's happened during the pandemic. And we see examples of this kind of approach all over, uh, all over the world and in various areas. So you know, if you take the issue of uh, simply prevention, and, I, and Amy brought up some examples as well, and I think Jamila too, you know, we see uh, maker spaces, local communities, like in India, there are these maker spaces where people, you know, have some basic equipment. Uh, they formed a collective of 42 of these maker spaces uh, around the country in India. Some of them were from rural areas. And very quickly, they started to make face masks with the material they had, sometimes using things like, or reusing things like transparency sheets, you know, um, and then delivering them to frontline workers in their city or town. Um, so, you know, you see that in the area of uh, prevention. Then you see it in the area of care. So people have been repurposing existing infrastructure to care for people. Um, in countries like India and Pakistan, but also in France, they repurposed uh, train compartments to make them into mobile uh, you know, wards to take people elsewhere and keep them safe and have them uh, attended to. There were pop-up hospitals that came up uh, around the world, including in Stadia and so on. And then third, in, in the context of cure, it's very interesting to see how doctors facing time pressures and so on have repurposed uh, existing drugs. We were talking about dexamethasone, which has you know, been around for a while, very cheap, affordable drug. And the doctors have found that that can be very effective in treating some of the uh, symptoms of, of uh, COVID. So you know, it's fascinating to me how these ideas become so relevant, particularly in a time of crisis, when you need to do things faster, better, cheaper for large numbers of people. I really share your your enthusiasm, Jaydeep, and and, uh, and also the the fact that several of these frugal innovations has been vital to uh, foster behavioral change, which is something that will be also vital to address the climate uh, uh, crisis. Uh, so, Amy, uh, you have already outlined that, uh, the idea of the potential. So, so when looking to the polls, you are uh, rather than 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 uh, um, being negative, you you see the fact that there is a huge potential uh, for uh, uh, foster innovation uh, in the COVID uh, response. But now I would be interested in hearing your, your views about uh, what is working and what is not working. Uh, uh, so you already uh, um, uh, emphasized the, this, the, the, the dimension, uh, but if you could now uh, uh, address uh, the point of what is working well to promote innovations, and what sh should we stop doing? Because that, that is also a, a vital element on, on tackling uh, innovation. It's, uh, it's uh, uh, stop some of these uh, harmful uh, uh, options. So over to you. Thank you. And I think that's a really helpful framing. What is working and what's not working? Let's get down to brass tacks here. I think many things are working, as I alluded to. Um, there is an, uh, a global outpouring of creativity and energy and support to come up with new ideas, to face these new challenges that we've never seen on this unprecedented scale, at least in our lifetimes. Um, the, the different open innovation calls that we have helped uh, be a partner to, whether it's organized by the World Economic Forum or Open IDEO, have surfaced many compelling and exciting new approaches, exactly to Jaideep's approach that can 
um, help us meet these needs more effectively, more frugally, more sustainably. Um, we've also, I think, developed a, a clear set of criteria because we, we don't need to just um, ask for ideas. We also need to be able to evaluate them. And um, our Center for Innovation and Impact has actually issued a Global Health Innovation Index to help equip our various stakeholders with a standard set of criteria that are flexible enough to accommodate PPP innovations to behavior change pieces, as you just mentioned, George, um, but still standard enough that we can have some um, confidence in how quickly they can be used and scaled. Um, so whether it's health impact or uh, demand, organizational capability or the progression that they've already demonstrated, I think these are four qualities that we can uh, really rigorously apply and therefore make sure that we are supporting those innovations that have the most promise. And I'm happy to share that uh, report. Um, it's, it's already posted and published on our website. On the what's not working, I think we have to be very clear and practical about the constraints that innovators face. Um, it's one thing to have a really good idea. It's another thing to navigate all of the regulatory behavior change, stakeholder coordination, and many other issues that have to be taken into account to actually deploy it and just deploy it at scale. Uh, so our team has really thought about, you know, what are the pathways to scale? What is all of the effort that needs to be undertaken and coordinated to get those innovations out? And also, how can we better partner with these um, other countries and local stakeholders to make sure it works for their setting? Uh, so we've been um, trying to design a country innovation platform that could help streamline this using a really user-centered, human-centered design approach that anchors this around what is needed in local country contexts. And then how can we as a donor support that process to streamline and connect innovators that would be appropriate for that context with those country uh, stakeholders that would be needed to, to bring it forward. And then finally, I would just also note another constraint that's probably obvious is money. Um, there's, we're in the midst of an uh, economic recession and the low and middle income countries that we are focused on are seeing enormous outflows of private capital. Foreign direct investment is leaving at an unprecedented scale. So how do we help um, these countries foster innovations that matter for them, whether it's through the public sector or the private sector? And let's consider both um, because there are certainly um, huge capital flows moving in pri the private sector that we could attract into the global health space. So our team has been working with our Development Finance Corporation counterparts, the DFC, to think about co-financing opportunities. Where might investment capital be relevant? How can we support social entrepreneurs um, with more than grants? You know, I think the technical assistance can be really important and sometimes catalytic grant funding can be transformative, but is there a viable pathway that allows us to bring in investors, um, possibly at slightly sub-market rates, um, but that will help us grow the resourcing pie, which will be crucial to enabling these innovations to succeed. You may want me to keep going on what's not working, but maybe I'll pause there. <laughs> I think we may have lost George. Our moderator. Yeah. <laughs> Um, maybe <laughs> Rahul just go on talking? wants to take over. <laughs> yeah, I think we have lost George. Apologies for that. I think maybe if we could uh, turn to Jamila and to get sure. your reflections on, sure. on the, the COVID response and, yeah. and what you think needs to change to foster game-changing innovations in the fight against poverty and inequality from your experience and uh, particularly in the current context, Jamila. Yeah, I think, first of all, I absolutely agree with what was said by Jaideep and uh, Amy. And, uh, you know, there are many heartwarming stories about how, you know, you even get, you know, prisoners who are very high risk groups to actually be sewing masks and, and PPEs and so forth for the general public. So, you know, innovation has also created a space for real empathy that, that cuts across different, uh, you know, social groups as well. Um, and, and one thing I think that, you know, if I can just build on some of these things about repurposing, I think, you know, it, one of the things that keeps me awake is the amount of PPEs we use and the environmental impact that, you know, we will have to live with uh, after this, right? So I think my, my point is that, you know, while we're facing a pandemic, 
we have a multi-sectoral need for innovation, not just in the health space, but also as a humanitarian space, the development space and the financial space, because all four are impacted. So as we move forward, I think we've got to think about how we connect all of these. Uh, you know, imagine if the, you know, a glove manufacturing uh, company could now really seriously look at its environmental impact and come up with biodegradable masks and, and other PPEs that are biodegradable. And I know that you know, in countries in the low, low resource countries, they are very good at this. We know the best uh, inventions on uh, uh, you know, menstrual pad was uh, invented in India by a man. Uh, you know, from banana leaves. So, so, so I think there's that space now that not, not only will, you know, address the challenges we face with COVID-19, but also the other impacts of COVID-19 on the environment, on, you know, on the economy and so forth. So I think one of the things uh, in Malaysia we've been looking at is also the financial aspect, right? So we've been really, uh, you know, experimenting with Islamic social finance uh, using, for example, uh, what we call a sukuk model, a bond, Islamic bond to actually, and it was so oversubscribed. Uh, and, the, and the bond was, uh, is going to be used to actually empower local women and communities, you know, to be able to have livelihood development and also looking at health aspects as well. So I think, you know, repurposing financial instruments as well to be able to deal with, with the health crisis. Um, one of the things, you know, beyond the response, the treatment and all that is, you know, we have a vaccine coming. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we have to think about the cold chains that will need to be established uh, in a country like Malaysia, where some communities are quite remote. You know, how do you make sure if there's no electricity, we can keep uh, vaccines in the, coal, uh, in the cold chain? So we are now starting to talk with telecommunications companies to look at, you know, the telco towers that have a generator at the bottom. Can they put a fridge, you know, uh, so that we can go into remote villages? And the other thing, of course, is logistics. So I've just come back from a very, uh, very badly affected part of Malaysia in Sabah and East, East Malaysia, where the lo logistics infrastructure is not as well developed as the West uh, Malaysia. And, you know, one of the innovative things we managed to set up is really having pooled uh, logistics resources, whether it's tourist buses and vans, you know, private companies, you know, so that uh, in hospitals in the more remote area, or when you want to move nurses and so forth, you can just almost like an Uber uh, application that you can actually call for that transportation. And, and the other thing, of course, is that one of the things, you know, I've been pushing the government to look at is really mental health, because I think the impact of COVID-19 on health workers is tremendous. And, you know, how do we now, level, we are using technology now to reach out to, you know, frontline workers to make sure that, you know, that, their psychological first aid, you know, is always there for them and, and some kind of mental, uh, mental health support. So bottom line, I think, you know, technology plays a very important role. We realize that with education, for example, nothing moves. If you have 20% of the country that doesn't have internet, you know, you, you're really creating, widening the socioeconomic gap. Uh, and I think partnership is key. I think this is a time where, uh, you know, it's not just about governments, also civil society, communities themselves, private sector, uh, you know, really looking at how, you know, that partnership can actually then not only um, utilize available, available expertise and resources, but also localize to what the needs are and then scale where it is possible. Thank you, uh, Jamila, and uh, I'm back, so I lost connection for one minute, and, and my colleague Roel, uh, there was the last question from this front, Jamila. Now, I would like to not move away from COVID, but, but go one step back to where we were uh, uh, one year ago on the SDGs. Uh, we know that uh, um, uh, sustainable, on the sustainable development and on the 2030 agenda, we were already off track the crisis and now uh, the crisis is exacerbating the risks uh, uh, on the SDG implementation and also on the financing. Uh, in the report that we launched last week, we said that uh, the, the, the gap now it's not $2.5 trillion, it's uh, $4.2 trillion. If you integrate the drop on external finance to developing countries with the additional needs uh, that they uh, um, uh, 
uh, are incurring to uh, uh, to address COVID. So the SDGs would be the the topic for this last uh, round, especially the the poverty and inequality dimension. And uh, I, I think it would be helpful to have a, a close look from from you in this topic. So and now I will start with uh, with with Amy. Uh, so Amy in in development cooperation, uh, our key interlocutors are governments and, and, and communities in low and middle income countries. So the question is, how can development partners best design and target their support to enable local solutions and local innovators to uh, address the, the SDGs? I think we need, I, I really want to pick up on Jamila's comment about empathy. And I think that the more that we can understand what local governments and how we can best partner together, stand in their shoes and, and um, be informed and shaped by what their values and priorities and constraints are, the more effective we will be collectively as a community to finding pathways to adopt innovations in a way that helps us achieve the SDGs and, and get back on track. So I think um, there are two approaches that I think we should really consider. One is being creative as donor partners on how we can help support our partner countries. Um, and the other is around um, thinking about the um, repurposing. How can we leverage past investments in innovation or existing capabilities, whether it's manufacturers who can now um, make masks or other kinds of PPE or other types of capabilities um, that we can bring to bear. On the creative side, I had, I had alluded to earlier thinking about a, a country innovation platform and what we're really trying to do there is to recognize that in some ways we have a global pileup of innovations or new ideas and we need to convert those into a true pipeline of innovations that can be used and adopted and scaled. And so how do we get from a growing set of ideas to an actual application of those ideas in the context where they make sense? we should go to those contexts, understand what all of their constraints are and identify only those new innovations that make sense for their context and their priorities. If they are interested in focusing on newborn health, let's make sure we bring them the best newborn health innovations and, and for their consideration. If they're focused on mental health, as Jamila was just noting, is going to be an enormous and growing um, space. How can we find the best in that area? So let's curate from our global stakeholders, the, the best that we can find for the local needs and do it in a, in a true partnership, empathy-driven way. Um, and then I think on the repurposing, let's be as mindful as we can of everything we already have access to, the manufacturing, the supply chains, the cold chain uh, ingenuity that has been just uh, demonstrated in the past with previous vaccines, um, the, the financing that already exists. How can we blend capital in new structures that build off of past ways that we've combined investors and grant capital um, to, to grow the pie and add more money into closing that gap that we currently face in the SDGs. So I think if we are creative and we repurpose thoughtfully and strategically, we can, we can get closer to achieving our SDG goals despite the setbacks we have seen from COVID-19. Thank you, Amy. In, in this round, I'm, I'm trying to, to bring the SDGs in a perspective of the international community, uh, but also uh, innovation, uh, locally led uh, innovation. So it's it's exactly the point that I would like to to raise uh, uh, and to be addressed by Jamila. Um, the international community uh, can provide resources, knowledge, but also uh, the the evidence and 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 the politically uh, capacity to engage. So those resources are important. But the question is, what should it do differently? The international community uh, to promote locally led uh, innovation. So in the first round, you remember, I was addressing the role of governments. Now uh, I, I'm trying to address the role of the international community to uh, boost the locally led uh, innovation. Over to you, Jamila. Thank you very much. I think this is a really important question because um, when you look at sustainable development goals, it's a very vertical process, whereas human beings live in a very horizontal way, right? The connectedness and so forth. Now, with the COVID-19 pandemic, we all know donors will be under severe pressure 
uh, the needs uh, are overwhelming. And I come from a humanitarian background. I know that the, the needs there are unmet because a lot of funding may, may eventually be, you know, uh, focusing on the health health crisis right now. The development needs are also extremely high. We know that COVID-19 didn't arise because out of nowhere, it is because of, you know, our, our developmental uh, problems, low socioeconomic, you know, status in some countries, the poverty, and also, you know, for me, it's a big, uh, you know, a violation of our planetary boundaries, which has really, which has really led to this. I think what donors will need to do is figure out where they get the bang for their buck, right? Where, how do they, 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 they do this? I'm a firm believer in localization. So I think that donors must now start investing and it usually costs much less when you invest local in supporting structures that will actually drive innovation, that will bring change to, to communities. At the end of the day, it's about people. Um, it, of course, there's some sustainable development goals that are about governance and so forth. But let me talk to you about the people and community level, because at the end of the day, it's people who fall sick and people who don't have water. So, so I think investing in that local innovation, you know, I come from the Federation of Red Cross, it's 192 countries. You know, that's where you get your local innovations. It's people there with communities. The second thing I think is that it needs to also drive a little bit of a, a regional approach. You know, I've always been a believer that ASEAN region where I live is this, you know, amazing experience, whether it's climate change impact, whether it's, you know, a health crisis, it's it's had that wide array, array of uh, experience. And, you know, why not invest, for example, on the health perspective, an ASEAN CDC or so, something like that, right? Where you can actually pool resources, research, innovation, that's very pertinent for the region, which has very unique, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, attributes. So I think, I think that, you know, that's how you you would want donors in future to behave, not do the usual. You can't do everything as before, investing in large organizations or something. You've got to go more local. And that means you need to take some risk. And, uh, and we don't talk enough about risk taking because donors don't like to take risks. But you can't get locally driven innovations if you don't take any risks. Um, but, uh, you know, so that's the entire mindset shift, if you like, right, that sustainable development goals will happen as much bottom up as it does top down. Well, I, 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 I cannot comment in <laughs> make comments for all the brilliant interventions that you are making, but on, but on this, I cannot, of course, waste opportunity to echo uh, your, your point on, on the risk taking. I, I really think it's, uh, uh, definitely vital, uh, and and we are we are uh, trying to address this, uh, including when discussing with the development finance institutions. Uh, this is the moment where uh, you will need to take more risk uh, to boost uh, innovation um, uh, and to, to create the conditions to uh, support those most uh, in it and those that are um, uh, being left behind uh, during this uh, crisis. So many thanks, Jamila, for for making that, that point. So Jadib, uh, I think that we have not yet addressed the role of the private sector. Uh, and I would like to have your views on private sector and uh, research. What do you think the international private sector uh, and research actors could do differently so, so that their uh, innovations help reduce poverty. We know that innovation is very much embedded in the private sector and even the risk taker approach. So, okay, so what's, what's the role that they could take uh, to uh, apply this, uh, this uh, innovation to address poverty? Great question, George. And of course, the private sector has a huge role to play, but how should they play out that role again? And, you know, there are big companies, of course, multinationals, some of the world's largest companies with a lot of resources. And there are startups now, very agile startups that are beating the big companies at their game around the world. Now, if you look at the big companies, the ones that were established, you know, in the 20th century and really grew powerful in the 20th century, the whole approach to innovation was very much about a technology push and very expensive. Uh, you know, they would have big R&D teams, big budgets, work on long-term projects, uh, often, you know, 
pushing the technology frontier for the sake of doing so. And you know, this is expensive. They would put that technology in their products, and because their customers uh, are quite affluent, they're all from affluent, big, you know, rich countries, they could charge their customers for this. And so innovation became synonymous with something that was expensive, both for the companies and for the customers, and would then only, you know, later on trickle down to lower income groups in the West or to emerging markets and developing countries. And I think that really, that approach really needs to change. Um, and it doesn't have to be necessarily an altruistic thing. It actually can make a lot of economic sense. So the business model, uh, the traditional business model in the West was, you know, uh, expensive process, but you have margins, you know, uh, high margins. And even if your volumes are small, you make a lot of money. And we see this in pharmaceuticals, we see this in medical devices and so on. Whereas in emerging markets, what you need to do is you need to have wafer thin margins. You can't you know, make a lot of profit. The pr product or service has to be highly affordable. But how do you make your profits? You make your profits by reaching lots of people. And of course, there are lots of people who have needs, unmet needs. So it can be highly profitable. And if you know the established incumbent large companies don't do this, they will be beaten at this game by emerging market counterparts in China and India and Brazil and Nigeria and so on that will do this and then beat them in their home markets. Or they'll be beaten by startups in their own markets, digital companies that are very smart and very agile and can move fast and also scale very quickly. And so I think, you know, large companies have a role to play. They're recognizing this and, you know, they're also learning how to do frugal innovation, how to do things faster, better, cheaper. And again, the pandemic has been revelatory. Look how quickly Pfizer moved uh, and not just Pfizer, you know, uh, AstraZeneca, all the big pharmaceutical companies, because of course there's money to be made. They will of course have to make it affordable, but there are large numbers. And very interestingly, they have not done it themselves. They have partnered with startups. This is fascinating, the story of the vaccine between Pfizer and the German biotech company. Great example of where the smaller companies can come up with the early ideas, you know, the fuzzy front end that what I was calling variation. And then the big company can come in and help scale it, do all the clinical trials, all that kind of stuff, infuse the expertise and the funding, and then use that distribution to reach large numbers. And of course, governments come in as well at that point. So I think the private sector has a huge role to play, but they have to turn their attention away from solely looking at the problems of the rich world to focus on the problems of the poor world. And after all, that's where the majority of people are, uh, not only in emerging markets now, but even in the developed countries. And you know, so that kind of frugal innovation can be far more inclusive uh, and can, you know, uh, can actually make a huge difference to uh, very large numbers of people. Thank you, and, and you will see that one of the that we are receiving from uh, the, the audience uh, uh, is the perfect segue to what you just mentioned. So I think that we are uh, a, a bit uh, beyond uh, the time that we that we're planning. It's manageable, so we are still uh, within the, the the time frame. Uh, we received a very interesting questions from uh, uh, the, the the audience. I'm I'm picking two uh, uh, questions uh, and uh, be very glad to hear from our uh, uh, panelists. So uh, I have one question that uh, maybe uh, both Jaydeep and, and, and Jamila could, uh, could take and then another question to, um, we, we have received a, a question from uh, Olga uh, and she wants to hear from, from you, colleagues, uh, about the interaction between uh, government, corporations, and citizens. Uh, if citizens would be co-designers of solutions, uh, or as uh, Jedip uh, uh, said, rowers, and governments would be there to steer them uh, in the right direction, there is still a gap. Uh, powerful corporations who often have more resources than many of the governments. So the question to both of you, J.D. Penn and Jamila, is what does the ideal state dynamic between these three entities look like? Uh, again, the three entities, it's government, corporations, and citizens. Uh, this question came uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, Olga, uh, uh, the founder of Play, 
collaborate and exchange. Uh, can we start with, with, with you, Jedi? It, I think it's the perfect segue with yeah. your last question. Yeah, indeed. It's a great question and a nice segue. And so, you know, we can see a number of different possible uh, ways in which these three players can interact. Um, and I would add a third group, which maybe all I would consider more citizens, which are the startups, you know, because as I said, there's this entrepreneurial revolution happening around the world. And often it's that they are social enterprises, they're solving social problems using, you know, the tools of business and technology. So, you know, one is the, you know, we, we discussed this actually in one of your questions, which was to create this ecosystem and the government's role and intergovernmental organizations like the OECD and so on can play the role of creating that space, which brings together the um, entrepreneurs and the grassroots innovators who are trying out experiments, who have early stage ideas uh, with the larger organizations that can then select these and scale them. They have the resources to do that. Uh, you know, Amy was talking about that, USAID has done that, OECD is facilitating that. And this is what happened again with uh, the Pfizer and uh, bio and tech example, you know. So the bio, the startup did something, had some technology that they had developed, which had potential for a vaccine. Pfizer saw that, they selected it, and then they've used their resources to help scale it in a very quick way. And of course, the governments will play a role as well at that at some point in helping distribute the vaccine, purchasing it in bulk. Well, that's already happening. Um, so they're the procurer. So government procurement can be a very powerful incentive to get this kind of alignment. And governments can create digital platforms, for instance, to bring these players together to solve problems that the government has identified as important problems. And what better problems than the SDGs? So the governments can highlight these are the challenges and then they can create incentives for bigger private sector companies to work with smaller companies to quickly come up with ideas that then the government can promote in some way, either by procuring them or creating the, you know, a, a regulatory sandbox where they can experiment with it and bring it to market faster. Thank you, Jadi. And green public procurement, it's a, a great way, for example, to incentivize innovation on, on, on climate uh, and, 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 and biodiversity. So, Jamila, on the same uh, topic. I think Jaydeep has uh, covered almost everything, but maybe just share uh, to share some of the experiences here. I mentioned earlier on about the innovation sandbox, about how it is uh, setting the space for nurturing, but also with capital. Uh, and bringing in the private sector as well to that, right? To, to, to help in the mentoring and so forth, but also being able to take whatever ideas there to, to scale. I think this is a very good uh, uh, you know, attempt to try and uh, bridge that whole, you know, as you said, the different sectors, corporate sector, uh, uh, communities, community organizations and, and government. The other thing I think is that, uh, Right now, for example, we are uh, tabling the budget in parliament. So I think, you know, giving those incentives and disincentives as well, uh, which could be equally important to the private sector in how it actually participates in nation building, which is about, you know, citizen, uh, citizen welfare, about making, ensuring that, uh, you know, people have access to, you know, their needs, right, and their basic needs. Of course, Malaysia is a middle income country, but, you know, I can see that in, in the uh, lower income countries, this is going to be very important because it really almost revolutionizes the, the thinking around citizen participation in, in you know, the national economy, right? So, so, so that's one aspect. One of the other things that we've done here as well is looking at you know, the, the real problems of unemployment which leads to all other social economic uh, problems and you know the SDGs, uh, some of the SDGs, and and to do this, what the government has done is really first of all again put in capital, put in the environment, uh, uh, for ecosystem for e employment opportunities, but also leveraging on private sector to have almost like an upskilling, reskilling, completely new skills. Uh, some, 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 some professions may no longer be relevant, but then use, getting the private sector to buy into this so that any kind of upskilling will already identify private sector um, companies that will, that will absorb these new, newly trained uh, uh, you know, 
newly trained people with their new skills. So really then, you know, creating that triangle where you have uh, unemployment on one hand, you know, uh, reskilling government incentives, and then the private sector waiting to 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 bridge that and and to employ uh, the person. So uh, it, it's already started. Already, there are a couple of thousand people already on the program. There's been uh, almost a, a large amount of money being put aside for this. So it's, it'll be very interesting how it pans out. Thank you, uh, Jamily. Uh, I. I would like now to, to ask uh, uh, Amy a, a question posed by uh, Semnet. Um, uh, he's saying that whilst I agree with the points made here, the 2020 crisis seems to have the only reaffirmed existing beliefs, regardless of one's background. Uh, however, what has the crisis told you uh, that uh, you didn't know or think before about development innovation paradigm? So, not an easy question, Amy. <laughs> no, and thank you, Sam, for that thought-provoking question. I think it is easy to um, see a crisis and have it reinforce what you have already been doing. And I think in some ways, um, I, I will note that I do continue to think of innovation as an important lever. Um, as challenges appear in unprecedented ways, I think we need unprecedented tools and approaches uh, to, to grapple with them. And that's fundamentally where innovations can give us new ideas. I also think that um, there is more to do. And I think it's a call to action for us as a, as a broader community thinking about innovation for LMICs um, to consider all the ways that we can enable that and maybe not just rely on the tools we have used in the past, but to really invest in new approaches, um, supporting partner countries on the adoption side, um, looking at the financing angle and considering innovative financing. Um, to enable the social enterprises that JD was just speaking to and to foster the sandbox that Jamila was just speaking to. How can we work together as donors, partner country governments, and private investors in ways that will feel new and maybe a little uncomfortable as everybody um, moves into different spaces on that risk spectrum? Um, risk has, has come up a lot in the last few minutes, and I, I certainly take that to heart. I hear that very well, um, that risk-taking is an important aspect of enabling innovation. I think one of the ways that the most patient of capital, which is grant capital, looking at a negative 100% financial return, one of the catalytic ways it can uh, be impactful is to combine it with re return seeking capital. So how can we lower the risk for investors to come in and invest with us for initiatives that we think will be impactful and for them can still generate some type of return uh, financially and impact wise uh, to, to grow the pie together. I think the, uh, another aspect um, that the crisis has revealed is that we can look more broadly than our traditional sectors. So whereas we might think of COVID-19 as its own area, it of course has spillover effects into uh, malaria treatment and diagnosis and um, HIV management and, and many other health areas and beyond. And Jamila was speaking to the economic impacts and livelihoods. And so how can we think of that holistically and and maybe look beyond the traditional silos um, that we have had in the development sector. And then I'll end with one more insight since I, I, I know you were pr provoking um, thoughts. And I, I think in addition to the um, COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen a global call for considering diversity, equity, and inclusion issues. And I think the more that we can broaden the conversation um, beyond the innovators that are already those that we know the best, um, and make sure that we are encouraging local innovators that might um, not be at the international conferences, might not already be on our radar. How can we um, invite them to join this conversation and bring their valuable ideas um, so that we can jointly have more impact? Thank you, uh, Amy. Clearly the, the, the crisis had, had shed some light on, on the potential of innovation um, that was uh, um, uh, underused. Uh, so we have uh, literally five minutes to, to close. I, I would need one minute to wrap up. So I propose that in one minute, uh, you would share uh, with us, uh, each of you, uh, what are you personally committed to doing differently in light of what has been revealed by the crisis? Um, so I know it's very difficult, but if you could in one minute express your commitment, uh, uh, your a commitment for uh, 
for action in the near future. Maybe we can uh, start with uh, with the Jamila, then Jadip, and then Amy. Jamila. So you're asking very personal commitments, and I think one of the things that has really reinforced my belief in the importance of planetary health. Uh, and uh, as such, you know, at, at a personal level, I have, you know, stopped taking meat, uh, you know, growing my own vegetables and trying to be a better citizen. Uh, but on the other hand, you know, I really am very keen to establish some kind of planetary health uh, alliance or center in this region because I think it, it needs it. So that's my big uh, goal right now. Thank you. Perfect. So I'm going to, mine is both personal and professional, if I may, and it is to do with, uh, you know, my job of education, but thinking differently about it. And, you know, being in a university that's been around for many centuries where people came to the university, that's the dominant idea of a university that's been blown out of the water by COVID. And, you know, we were already moving towards thinking of going to our students rather than expecting them to come to us using digital and other means. But it's just been accelerated by the crisis because literally in a week, we had to go from delivering classes in person to doing everything online and so forth. And then you realize the potential of doing that when you're forced to do it. You realize, you know, what you could have been doing all this time and weren't doing. Um, so just, you know, rethinking how we reach people uh, as, as uh, you know, as teachers and educating, particularly young people who, as I was saying earlier, are, you know, been bitten by this bug of entrepreneurship and particularly to solve social problems. And now there's this opportunity to reach, you know, such a large number of these young people wanting to make change in their societies ground up. Uh, through digital means and not the conventional lecturing to them. On the contrary, it's actually just listening to them and perhaps suggesting a few things or connecting them to other people. And so I see my role as an educator having changed profoundly uh, and will have to change profoundly because of this crisis. Thank you, Amy. I think I'll add a, a personal and professional one as well to, to follow in this vein. Um, I am a member of the inaugural Women Lift Health Leadership Cohort, and I think that has really helped um, broaden my perspective on how I think about who's included in this innovation conversation and, and global health more broadly. So building on the, my last comments about expanding those who are part of this conversation on innovation and global health, um, I am personally committed to seeing how we can uh, be very intentional in that effort and make sure that we are enabling um, female innovators, we are enabling locally based innovators, and we are not just um, resting on the status quo, but actively seeking and examining how we make decisions and set priorities to enable as inclusive an innovation environment as possible, because I think that will serve us all better in the long run for getting the best ideas and the most impact. Thank you. I think that we are all inspired by, by, by our panelists. Uh, I would like in in one minute to just emphasize one element. It's important, impossible to wrap up such a rich discussion. I would like only to emphasize one, one element. We, we have seen during this discussion that innovations have a, a great potential to uh, advance global sustainable development. So to address the crisis, the pandemics, but also the other crises that were with us before, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, the poverty, the inequalities. Uh, but to, to truly reduce poverty and inequalities, we need to change track. Uh, governments in uh, low and middle income countries uh, can do more uh, to create an enabling environment for innovation. This was emphasized by uh, our speakers, but the international community must also do their, their share. Uh, it needs to focus on uh, innovations that uh, benefit the poorest uh, uh, and reduce inequality. So uh, development cooperation plays a vital role uh, to uh, foster uh, innovation. And this requires investing more in, in closer partnership uh, with stakeholders in partner countries to support solutions that work in the local context. Uh, so these points were, were uh, brilliantly emphasized by our uh, speakers. So let me commit with something. So now it's my turn to uh, I'd like to commit as, as head of the, the Development Cooperation Directorate uh, to uh, support this effort in the new uh, scaled up work on uh, innovation for development uh, 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 within the DAC. So we have a new program of, of work and budget 
and this is a priority for the next uh, biennium. We hope to use uh, that to continue this dialogue with a, uh, with a broad range of stakeholders, making sure that we mobilize the full potential of development cooperation to support and enable uh, innovation. And I want to close again by thanking uh, the participants, um, especially for Jamila, it's very, very late. I'm, 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 I'm very sorry for, uh, for bringing you uh, so, so late. I'd like also to thank Jaydeep uh, uh, and, and Amy for the, the excellent uh, contributions and all the, the audience. But I would like, uh, as you mentioned, also to thank my, my team, uh, Raul, uh, Max, Santos, uh, Marianne, that have been uh, made all this uh, uh, effort available. Many thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Hope to stay in touch. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, same here. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye.